Welcome to uh, this evening's session on um, structuring uh, a teaching event, which was the title I gave uh, the session when I was discussing this with um, Andy some time ago. Um, I subsequently changed uh, my thoughts about this to structuring a learning event because uh, in many respects the, the focus of attention is on actions that we can take as uh, facilitators of uh, learning events. Um, to uh, create an environment that is uh, suitable, appropriate, challenging, developmental, etc., for our, our learners. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I, uh, I'm Mike Davis. I, I work as a freelance consultant in medical education, um, working predominantly with the life support community and with some of the medical royal colleges and uh, other organisations. Like uh, Andy, I, I'm uh, interested in following up any uh, Twitter discussion, so if you could include in any tweets that you might use uh, my um, uh, tags here uh, and uh, hash practice for anything uh, that is specifically related to this particular discussion. <coughs> uh, if anybody wants to follow up on an, an email, my email is here, mikedavis8702 at aol.com, and I will respond to you uh, relatively quickly. Uh, the purpose of this session essentially is to build on some of the things I was talking about in an earlier session on um, some of the useful principles of adult learning uh, to consider the ways in which uh, it is possible to create uh, and recognize a robust structure for any teaching event and by any teaching event I, I mean uh, more or less any modality that you may choose to uh, operate within. Um, Obviously, there are some that are much more commonplace than others, and some that have greater demands on um, the resource, uh, resources, including human resources, uh, in terms of personnel and equipment and so on. Uh, but this uh, can apply to everything from you being the sole presenter uh, uh, in a lecture, to running small groups, to running workshops, perhaps with colleagues, to running more adventurous uh, activities including role plays, um, simulations, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, essentially, uh, what I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping to convince you of is that uh, by paying attention to some very uh, specific uh, principles, it's possible to have a, a well-structured, well-organized presentation that will have much more meaning for uh, your participants than something where you just go in and uh, tell everybody everything that you know about whatever happens to be your uh, subject matter of interest. So this is the, the learning outcome uh, that we have for the session. Almost invariably with um, a webinar like this, uh, the, uh, the conversation is going to be somewhat one way, but uh, I've discussed with, uh, with Andy uh, that uh, uh, if uh, any questions appear in the question box uh, during the course of the, the webinar, uh, he will uh, um, interrupt the conversation and uh, I will try to respond uh, to that particular question. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is just to show you a, a short video. And uh, what I want you to think about uh, are two questions. Um, what evidence of preparation can you see in uh, the short video? And uh, to invite you to make a list of, uh, of everything that you see. And I'm hoping this transfer to another screen is now going to work trouble free. Kilograms. It's incredibly heavy. And it's suspended from the roof of the Faraday Lecture Theatre by this steel cable. Now what I'm going to do is to take this steel ball over here and I'm going to stand with my back against this headrest. And in a moment I'm going to place it against my face and then I'm going to let go. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to swing out across the lecture theatre and then it's going to swing back towards my face. Now, according to the laws of physics, it should stop just before it touches me. OK, that's the theory. Let's see what happens. I think this is probably worth a countdown, isn't it? OK, are you ready? Three, two, one, go! I'm very pleased that the laws of physics are nice and robust inside the Royal Institution. 
Right, I hope you were all able to see that and uh, to consider um, the, the question that I asked you to uh, think about. And my guess is that for the majority of you, uh, the sort of things that you were uh, focusing on was the issue around um, the presenter's understanding of um, some basic physics uh, that in the process of preparing for this session he felt that he needed to convince himself that that ball wasn't going to crush his skull uh, as it swung back towards him. But I think that there are other things that I want you to consider uh, as well as, as that particular element as part of the presentation. Because I think it's um, almost axiomatic that we can take for granted that the person who's making a presentation knows whatever laws are, are applying to his, his or her particular subject matter. Uh, in this case, uh, gravity. In the case of what we're involved in, perhaps aspects of, uh, of medical education. But it's the, those other things that we think I think are a little bit more uh, interesting for the purposes of uh, this particular talk. And what I'm talking about here are issues associated with environment. Um, the environment is a, a key ingredient in any teaching event. And uh, it contains things as, as basic as uh, heat. Is the space that you're involved in um, sufficiently warm? Is it lit if uh, it needs uh, to be lit? Um, is there adequate seating? Uh, are people comfortable? Does the audio visual equipment work? And are assistants appropriately briefed? And all of these considerations are part of, um, I'm sorry about that, they are part of uh, the environment. Uh, and these are things that are in uh, the control of and the responsibility, in fact, of the person whose session it is. And this means that quite a lot of effort has got to go into um, not only preparing the content of the subject matter, but making sure all of these other particular elements of it are um, thought through. Uh, the most basic, um, you're meeting what uh, you may remember from uh, other sessions uh, from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You're meeting the physiological needs of your participants in uh, making, uh, paying attention, paying appropriate attention to um, the, uh, the environment. So things like uh, heating, lighting, seating, equipment, assistance, whether your participants have had reasonable coffee breaks and so on and so on uh, are important ingredients in this bottom end of Maslow's hierarchy of need. And for some reason my computer keeps galloping along at a huge speed. Okay, so I'll try to resist touching anything that I shouldn't be touching. The next uh, key consideration is set. And set is uh, the point at which um, you begin to engage with um, your audience. And there are a significant number of components to the set. The first of these, uh, and um, what these, uh, these three components are addressing, uh, these three areas highlighted in red here from Maslow's hierarchy of security, belonging, and esteem. So essentially, these ingredients all together create an environment within which people can move towards self-actualization, uh, which is the point at which people begin to learn. So what are the components of SET that make uh, a difference to a successful uh, teaching session? The first of these is um, introductions. Um, it, this is about letting people know who you are uh, and what your particular role is uh, within the context of the training environment um, that you uh, are engaged in at that moment. Depending on the size of the group, you may also be interested in finding out who your group is. So if it's a relatively small group, perhaps involved in skills teaching, you may want to find out what people's background and experience are, uh, particularly in relation to the skill or skills that you're going to be teaching. Similarly, with a, a small group discussion or something of that nature, you may have reasons for wanting to know a little bit more about who you've got in your audience, because you may adjust content in the light of that um, sort of information. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the, um, the second uh, element of uh, our concern is you introducing yourself and, and claiming 
by virtue of your, uh, your background, experience and so on, some credibility. And uh, we had a, I came across a very interesting uh, definition from Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, who described credibility as having three components. Uh, the first is uh, competence, uh, that he described as being good sense. The second was integrity, which he called, uh, which he thought of as good character. And the third was caring, which he described as, uh, as goodwill. And I think all of these ingredients are important components of you claiming and maintaining credibility. The third element is um, the learning outcomes. And the learning outcomes are statements indicating uh, what you expect learners to be able to achieve by the time they've uh, reached the end of their session. And uh, increasingly, these are thought of as in, uh, and presented in terms of can-do type statements. By the end of the session, you will be able to demonstrate X, Y, or Z type statements so that people can, in a sense, both assess themselves and, if necessary, be assessed by uh, other people. So the learning outcomes are brief statements that accommodate all of the territory that is going to be covered during the course of the session. It may well be fairly reasonable not to have too many learning outcomes. You may, as I did this evening, only have one, or for a slightly uh, longer session uh, with more complexity, there may be uh, more than that. The next thing that you need to address is, is motivation. And you can perhaps think about doing this quite subtly uh, by exploring people's uh, perceptions of what it is that they're there for. An extremely important question to have in mind about your, uh, your listeners or your participants in a, a learning event is helping them to answer the question, why am I here? And it may well be in the days of, uh, of um, mandatory and other training requirements that people are there because they feel that they have to be there uh, and that is so-called extrinsic motivation and that's where people feel the need to complete CPD documentation for instance uh, or um, to fulfill mandatory training requirements or to have a good C, uh, C, um, CV item or to complete a, a qualification cycle or something of that nature. Uh, but they also may be intrinsically motivated because they want to become a better teacher or they want to become a better practitioner in whatever field it happens to be involved in. Um, often people think of motivation, uh, intrinsic motivation, the inner drives, as being uh, better than the, uh, the more externally driven uh, motivators. Um, I don't tend to share that view. I think that people may well be extrinsically motivated, but by fulfilling all sorts of other requirements that we have of good facilitation, you can actually convert that uh, to people wanting to learn about your subject matter uh, and the way in which it is being taught. The final uh, element of um, uh, uh, the set is uh, roles. It's by the, it's that opportunity that you take to depict what it, it is that is going to be expected of participants. And uh, part of the function there is to alert people to the fact that you may be asking them questions or they may have the opportunity to ask you questions or you're going to involve them in discussing things with their neighbours or other members of the group or a whole range of other things. It might simply be in a, a large lecture theatre, 300 people in a darkened room, for example, their role is simply to sit and listen to your presentation and possibly ask questions at the end. Or in a much more um, small group, uh, a more intimate group, um, the role expectation may be that they will participate by actively contributing their experiences, understanding, insight, and so on. So there's a number of different ways in which that role can be represented, but it's far better to let people know as part of the set what your expectations are going to be. So we've managed so far to talk about um, the environment, the responsibility that we have to create a, 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 a safe, um, comfortable, potentially dynamic space uh, where technology works and so on, uh, and um, have expectations that people will then 
uh, be able to participate fully by you letting them know certain sorts of things that you have in terms of your expectations of the session. You then go to the, uh, the key next ingredient, which is um, a dialogue. And the dialogue is that substance, the, the main substance of the talk that you're engaging in. This is where you're um, providing the knowledge, uh, exploring the, the complexities of an issue, uh, or where, where you're perhaps de demonstrating the skill, or perhaps you're allowing a scenario to unfold. And the dialogue is, uh, in a sense, um, obviously, um, the most important element of the, the program. This is the part during which the uh, participants are probably going to do the most learning. It's where we're reaching the point in uh, Maslow's hierarchy, where because of um, the fact that you've uh, spent a lot of time creating safe environments and so on, uh, that people can actually uh, trust themselves to engage in things that are possibly potentially challenging, new and different. And uh, just to think for a moment about what sense we might make of this um, extremely untidy looking uh, image in front of us, um, we could think about this in, in this very simplistic way. The, the, the green dots uh, is what we already know when we come to a learning event. These are the things that we know about um, a particular subject matter. The red dots may be things that is a little bit new or possibly slightly different interpretations on things that we thought we knew um, before. And the yellow dots may well be things that are completely surprising, completely new, possibly contradictory to information that you've had from previous experiences by virtue of these being challenging, uh, new discoveries, and so on and so on. Now, I'm not suggesting that every event is going to be like that, um, but it's just a, a way in which we can think about the dialogue as being something that is there to represent knowledge that is already uh, around uh, within the domain that people um, uh, belong to, um, but nevertheless, hopefully, is going to uh, take them in slightly new directions as, as a consequence of their experiences. The reason that these dots are all linked together is that in acquiring or having confirmed one set of ideas, uh, it has implications for other ideas also, and that uh, the way in which we acquire uh, new knowledge or have all, uh, existing knowledge validated in certain sorts of ways creates patterns of expectation and future behavior that are extremely important parts of our learning and development. Because, let's face it, the key ingredient of our uh, experiences and our engagement with uh, learning environments is that we want to learn new things, and learning new things means perhaps giving up some old things. and among the consequences is uh, that um, as a result of our learning, we change. What this part of the program is all about is identifying what uh, I've called quite crudely as really useful stuff. This is the by far the majority component of any teaching session is the time during which uh, people talk to one another, engage with one another, engage with you, or listen, perhaps um, actively, hopefully, to new ideas that are being presented to them in a more formal en environment. So the really useful stuff is uh, probably represents nine, possibly not as much as 90, 80, or 90 percent of the total time that's available to you. And part of the issue that you address during this time is uh, what exactly is going on during this, uh, this period. And this obviously depends on the teaching modality that you're engaging in. Um, if it's uh, a lecture, the much of the really useful stuff may be you telling people things. Um, if you're attempting to engage more interactively with a lecture audience, it may be you telling people things and you posing the sorts of questions that you might um, uh, want to, to ask them uh, in the sort of traditional lecture environment. Or you may be wanting them to spend more of their time talking to one another. It very, very much depends on the teaching modality you're engaging in. In some teaching modalities, for example, a small group discussion, it may well be that your contribution to the really useful stuff involves you saying very little at all. 
because what you do is you in that environment is that you pose a problem uh, and then leave the group to uh, talk to one another to help solve that particular problem and uh, some of you may recognize this in um, uh, forms of uh, <coughs> problem-based learning type environments or um, small or other small group activity discussions that sort of situation is also true of, um, of uh, scenario teaching, uh, simulation environments, ranging from the low fidelity environment where the facilitator might simply be providing clinical signs to the more complex and sophisticated sub simulation environments where the facilitator is doing other things, for example, being uh, a consultant at the end of the telephone line, uh, taking a call about uh, a, a patient who is deteriorating quickly from a more junior colleague. So the, the nature of the dialogue is highly dependent on um, the particular teaching modality that they're engaging in. And it can range from doing an awful lot of talking, as uh, unfortunately I'm having to do at the moment, to um, doing very, very little talking but having created an environment within which lots of conversation takes place among members of the group. Um, I want to illustrate this latter point because I think it is potentially uh, problematic for um, people to think about it in these sorts of terms uh, because they have a sort of tendency to think of, of teaching um, as being something that um, they do uh, all the talking within. And what we have here is a, a situation of um, a map, a sociogrammic uh, map of interactions among people uh, involved in a, a, a teaching session. And quite clearly, the blue, per, the, the, the circle in blue represents the person who is perhaps initiating the conversation in the first place. But you can, and you can see that those contributions that are made by the blue circle are all to the group as a, as a whole. But then what you have is what you have then is the beginnings of interaction among members among and between members of the group where they're talking to one another, they're talking to the group as a whole, and so on and so on. And the conversations that take place between the person facilitating the session and other individual members of the group and the group collectively become considerably less. In some respects, those contributions may be um, almost non-existent, and there are certain approaches to managing small group interaction where the facilitator may make an opening um, observations um, and possibly make the occasional micro-summary or redirection during the course of a conversation, uh, and then only speak again when it comes to the last couple of minutes or so as the conversation comes to an end. Uh, and that's really one extreme of the uh, approach to facilitating small groups. Um, but it, it, and it can be thought of uh, in that sort of situation as being highly successful. You may have noticed that the, the word I've used a number of times to talk about the, the role of the person running a session uh, was um, the facilitator. And I just want to take a, a brief moment to describe how um, the origins of that word in terms of the way in which we think about these sorts of practices. The person thought to be significantly responsible for developing this notion was uh, an American academic uh, called David Kolb, who uh, I heard uh, talking at a conference a number of years ago in, in Finland. And uh, he described the role of the facilitator um, uh, as being like the host of a successful dinner party. He said that what you do is that you create a, a wonderful environment, uh, you provide nice food and drink, you invite the right people who can all make a contribution to it, and you make sure that their plates are full and their glasses are full, and you encourage lots and lots of conversation. And your role isn't to dominate proceedings, but rather to create an environment within which everybody can play, play an active part. And I think that that is fully representative of my view of, of the, um, the facilitator in a whole variety of teaching modalities, probably with the exception of the most formal lecture pre or presentation that you might give at a, 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 a conference or something of that nature. So that's essentially the, the, 
the, the dialogue. The dialogue is a, a very full, a very uh, intellectually rich and hopefully challenging place where people can um, have their existing knowledge confirmed, have possibly some of their preconceptions challenged, um, are introduced to new and interesting ideas, are exposed to the practices and experiences of other people in their groups, and uh, in general um, are, are uh, in a situation where they feel confident that they've had a productive period of time. So where do we go from from here? Well, quite simply, we come to the fourth element of um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the process that we described right at the very beginning. And this is called closure. And closure is that point at which uh, a number of things happen, but essentially the ingredients are where uh, people begin to get a picture of what it is that they're um, expected to have learned. And this is, this is a, a complex um, phenomenon, and I think it's nicely illustrated uh, in this uh, drawing of, um, of uh, uh, I suppose, really an optical illusion. Um, the inner triangle um, doesn't, of course, exist in anything other than our mind's eye. Um, and this is the way in which the components of the experience that uh, people have during the course of a teaching event come together with existing knowledge, existing perceptions, existing pre-conceived uh, ideas about various sorts of subject, subject matter and come to, uh, to make some sort of coherent sense. And uh, it may well be that that isn't something that they can um, be confident about right at that moment. There may be uh, things that continue to resonate um, way beyond the, uh, the, the, uh, the period of time when the, the session has ended. And that's actually a, a, a key ingredient and has huge implications for the way in which we evaluate sessions. And perhaps we can uh, spend a few moments on thinking about that a little later. So closure is that point at which you come in towards the last few minutes or so of a presentation where you're thinking about what it is that um, people have learned, but before they get to answering that question in full, providing opportunities for uh, clarifying things that possibly aren't entirely clear. Um, so it has three ingredients. The first of these is, um, is in fact, to clarify. And it's an opportunity that you give at, the t at that time with the audience to ask any questions that they may have about the subject matter that you um, have been talking about or you, you've presented to them by virtue of the discussion or the, um, the small group or the workshop or the simulation or whatever it happens to be. So an opportunity to, to clarify, to seek uh, confirmation of perceptions and so on and so on. Bringing things into a, a clearer focus so that people can go away um, possibly having had their ideas challenged somewhat. How much time you can spend on uh, asking and answering questions is highly dependent on your, um, your the planning that you've put into the session. It may well be that you've only got the opportunity to answer three or four questions, or possibly even less than that, <coughs> if the questions are, are complicated or require compl complex answers. So it's, 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 that's down to a little bit of a um, possible judgment calls and making arrangements to perhaps address issues that you haven't had time to address during the course of a session. For example, by providing uh, Twitter opportunities or email opportunities, things of that nature. Be aware that people may ask questions um, to, uh, to demonstrate their uh, knowledge rather than to seek knowledge. Uh, and you will possibly recognize these uh, from uh, previous experiences. Um, but Generally, on the whole, if, you, if your session has gone well with a group of people who are quite clearly keen to learn and enthusiastic about their subject matter, the likelihood is that the questions would be interesting, challenging, and satisfying. So after the questions, what comes next? Well, essentially, what you're doing at this point is that you're revisiting the, um, the content uh, of um, the very, very early part of your set which was the learning outcomes. You're reminding them of what you set out to do in your session, 
was to give them access to uh, particular sorts of characteristics and you're now stating we have reached the point where hopefully you have achieved these particular um, uh, um, uh, objectives. Um, and that's a question that uh, the audience can answer for themselves and you can to a certain extent if you've done all, all your preparation and uh, you're adequately um, covered the territory that you set out to cover, have reasonable expectations that that's what you've done. So, so far in, clo in closure we've got questions and summary. Uh, you might argue, well that's as far as you go. Well actually no, there's one final element uh, that you need to pay attention to and that is closure. Uh, sorry, that is um, termination. The moment when you say, okay, it's now time for you to go and have a cup of coffee or stay where you are, there's going to be another session or there's going to be another workshop or another simulation, you're letting people know that your responsibility for that particular component has reached an end. And it avoids that situation where people are not quite sure what's happening next. Okay, so I've just come to the end of my dialogue. So the point we are at now is, um, are there any questions? And uh, I'm now throwing this back to you, uh, uh, Andrew, to see whether you've picked up anything on, uh, online that uh, uh, has been asked so far, or giving people the opportunity now to, uh, to think about framing a, a question that they may want to ask. Yeah, as, as we said, um, there isn't any questions lined up at the moment, um, but on your question panel, on your um, mobile device, on your screen, you have indeed got the opportunity to type a question. Or if you want to be, um, if you want to throw the vote out on this Sunday evening, if you pop your hand up uh, by pressing the little hand icon, I will unlock your microphone and you can ask um, Dr. Mike Davis a question by uh, by speaking over the microphone. Uh, and so we can do that. Just throw the vote out and do something completely different. So if you don't fancy typing the question, uh, just pop your hand up and I will unlock your microphone and, uh, <laughs> and invite you to speak. I think we it is important. We had a question asked this week Mike, by email, and that was, um, yeah. do you think there will be a future alternative to presenting or teaching by PowerPoint? Um, well, yeah, I suppose this is a, a not an uncommon uh, question nowadays, um, uh, particularly when people do talk about death by PowerPoint quite frequently, don't they? And uh, I think we've all been in that situation where we go into a room and we know that the person in front of us is going to wade their way through possibly hundreds of um, slides with uh, assorted animations that aren't necessarily particularly helpful and they then read those slides to the audience. Uh, we've all experienced that I think on in, in probably on far too many occasions. There are a number of alternatives to PowerPoint. Um, uh, some of them uh, seem to work reasonably well and offer an interesting alternative um, and I, I have in mind uh, a program called Prezi that some of you may have come across which is a sort of animated version, a much more animated version perhaps of PowerPoint and the, 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 there's the Apple Mac version of, um, of PowerPoint and its own presentation which I think is called Keynote. Um, I think in some respects that there's, a, there's a, an, an implied other question behind it. Are we forced into a situation where we are expected to be able to uh, look at slides as well as listen to a person talk? And uh, if you think about the origins of the lecture, uh, historically, it was probably only for the last hundred year or so, hundreds of years, hundred years or so, that we've had the capacity to um, project information onto a screen using one technology or another. Um, my guess is that uh, it's going to occupy only a short um, length of time in the future. I think that what we're increasingly seeing is the, the capacity and the potential to use projection uh, for much more dynamic purposes than currently we have as represented by, for example, the default settings on PowerPoint, which on the whole are words with bullet points. Yeah. So a short answer to your question is, yeah, watch this space. I suspect that there are going to be um, continuing movements away from the idea, particularly of words on screens. And uh, you know, you'll be looking at possible animations, possibly much more mixed media, multimedia, use of game type approaches, 
Uh, there's, a, there's a, an approach to learning called gamification that uses some of the, the techniques that have been developed for, um, for video games and so on and to uh, provide learning opportunities and so on. I think there are, there are, there are lots of opportunities out there worth exploiting. Yeah, we're, we're seeing some new technology coming on board at the moment um, that we're going to uh, very shortly try with some of these recorded webinars, and so uh, we shall keep you posted. Okay, Richard, I have just unlocked your microphone, so uh, if you want to ask Dr. Davis a question, you are free to do so. Yes, thank you. Uh, it kind of follows on from, from your own question, really, um, but obviously ad adults... Um, not not sort of responding well uh, as uh, as learners to a lecture which you, you sort of alluded to um, and and obviously uh, um, because they're bringing a lot of experience uh, life yeah. experience as well as professional experience um, it's more about interaction and okay. and I suppose it is very similar I, I was going to ask about you know some some different uh, sort of teaching or facilitating techniques um, where where you know uh, we're sort of interacting with the, with the audience um, yeah. whether, whether you've got any sort of lined up on on there or, or if you know of um, a website or anything that could go on to get get sort of um, lesson ideas really yeah I, I think that that was a very good question and uh, perhaps I, I didn't emphasize this um, sufficiently well in my section on on dialogue um, Personally, my, my belief is that even in the most formal um, settings, like, for example, lecture, interaction um, both between the lecturer and members of the audience, and in fact between among members of the audience, is a vital component of the learning experience. And this is all dependent on um, the types of, uh, of, uh, of questions you ask to a certain extent. And um, I don't know whether I could quickly illustrate what I mean here by going to a, a, a different file. Can you bear with me while I do, I, I do this? Um, yeah, of course. Uh, essentially, um, people may be familiar with um, with uh, the, the, the sorts of different type, the, the different sorts of questions that you might be wanting to ask um, people in an, uh, an audience. Um, some questions uh, can be very, very basic questions, uh, 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 right at the very bottom end of the cognitive hierarchy. Um, and uh, the sort of questions that I, I have in mind, I can't find that actually without sort of uh, paying attention sufficiently well to what you're doing now. Uh, what I've got in mind are the questions that distinguish between a question like, for example, what is the capital of Norway? the answer to which is Oslo, which is a knowledge question, to a question that's further up the, um, the cognitive hierarchy. And I, a, a better example comes to mind. So if you have a, a typical English educated me, uh, audience, you might ask a question like, what was the year of the Battle of Hastings? And you can guarantee that if somebody was educated in England, they would know the answer to that uh, question. Uh, and of course it's 1066. Um, if you said to that same audience, why did William of Normandy invade? Um, you've got a different sort of uh, challenge to the, uh, the, mm -hmm. the collective knowledge of the audience. Um, and very, very few people in fact know the answer to that question because it's not the sorts of knowledge that they're taught in school type history. Um, but it's only at the comprehension level of um, the cognitive hierarchy. And the further and further you go up the cognitive hierarchy, the more complex the questions become. So right at the very top of the cognitive hierarchy in relation to that particular question is, what are the implications for the 21st century uh, British life because of the invasion of William of Normandy in 1066? And the answer to that question uh, demands a very subtle appreciation of history, uh, sociology, philosophy, psychology, psychology, uh, linguistics, etc., 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 as well as simple history. Um, so, for example, to know that uh, the current modern English language has got hundreds of words from Norman French in it um, is uh, 
a requirement of you having the ability to answer that question. So you need lots of knowledge, but you also need sophisticated thinking skills to get to the top of it. Now, you can ask low-level knowledge questions in a conventional lecture, and you get interaction between the mem individual members of the audience and the lecturer. But you can also ask questions that are on their way up that cognitive hierarchy of the audience and say, talk about this amongst your nearest neighbours and have that sort of discussion uh, that may well allow them to use out some of the implications of the, um, the, the issues that you want to address. And um, that, de that demands of you as a facilitator a couple of things. The first is that you need to know what sort of question to pose and have in mind a clear sense of, their, of people's capacity in terms of uh, knowing enough to be able to answer that question. But also, more importantly, in terms of process, having a willingness to trust the audience to engage in a process that is directly in your control. Because what you're saying to, is, to people is, here is a problem I want you to discuss this with your next door neighbour and come up with some uh, potential answers. Mm -hmm. Your next step depends on how many people you've got in your group and it may well be that you'd go around various parts of the audience inviting people mm. to, um, to share their thoughts yeah. or you may simply trust the process and say okay you've had some thinking about this and what I think is X, Y or Z and you're engaging people in a quite a different way um, largely due to you know, your uh, willingness to engage in a process whereby you trust people a little bit to, in, to involve themselves mm. or independently and autonomously um, uh, to uh, seek the answer that they're looking for. Does that help? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, if I can just follow on with a, a follow-up question to the, from that. Um, it's, it's, Sort of, I'm studying my cert at the moment, and, and I know when you're planning a, a lesson, so to speak, you're, you're sort of looking at, at progressing up through Bloom's taxonomy. Do, do yeah. you feel that when you're preparing your questions, um, whether it be for you know a, a lecture or, or a lesson uh, interactive, that, that you should be building up, you should be starting a bit lower, and maybe starting with um, <coughs> a, a comprehensive comprehension yeah. question and then and then slowly build up to you know um, I think, yeah, I, I think yeah. you can't go straight in at the what's the meaning of life type level uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's appropriate but what you can do is you can target and be um, in a sense be um, optimistic about what you might reasonably expect from your audience um, and if you don't get it right, be willing to drop down a couple of levels maybe. So you may ask mm -hmm. a question that's towards the top end of the cognitive hierarchy and find that people are a, a little bit anxious perhaps about, you know, sort of testing their ideas out. There's certainly, that's far more likely if you're saying, what's the meaning of life? Tell me what the meaning of life is. But if you're saying, the question I'm posing to you is, what's the meaning of life? Discuss this with your next door neighbours for the next five minutes. And you've got a different mm -hmm. sort of dynamic then that's emerging from the group. And that's where the group begin to uh, become more autonomous and more independent of you as the, of the facilitator. And uh, they're probably going to come away from that feeling much more uh, energized by the process than you simply telling them um, a, a lot of things that may uh, contribute towards their understanding of the meaning of life or not, as the case may be. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much for your question, Richard. <coughs> Okay, Mike, we have some more questions for you now. Uh, Darshan says, how can you determine and cater for various learning styles in a group of participants? Uh, good question. Uh, and learning styles uh, often comes up uh, as, as an issue. Um, I think I've got two answers to that question. They're, they're, they differ uh, in, 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 in intent, really, um, for reasons that I think will become clear in my response. The first is that the experience as a whole of a session ought to try to accommodate the fact that some people prefer to do some things more than others. And this for me is the purpose of, for example, um, avoiding uh, lots and lots of words on, on PowerPoint slides. I mean, you'll notice from my own slide set that there are very few words uh, kicking around um, on the presentation. Um, essentially, it's, it's one of those situations whereby you um, uh, I've just lost my thread now. Can you repeat the second part of the question again, Andrew? I, I got carried away there. I can, yeah, dude. Um, 
And how would you cater for various learning styles in a group of participants? Oh, yes, it was the, le the learning styles issue. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I think it's a, about accommodating the fact that you do have these particular preferences and that you do want people to engage visually uh, and uh, auditorily and possibly read-write, although I think that's probably got the least useful thing. Um, being involved kinesthetically in a lecture is, is a bit of a challenge as it is in a small group discussion. Um, obviously, that's an opportunity that you might want to make presentations available throughout the course as a whole. So, for example, one of the courses I teach on um, uh, does involve a certain amount of, uh, of sitting around in lecture theatres, but it also involves lots and lots of practical work. So, during the course of a day, perhaps you're addressing all of the learning style needs of your audiences, but you, that's harder to do perhaps um, in the the, the, um, the uh, a session of 40 minutes or so. The second thread, and this is where I got a little bit um, sort of uh, uh, stuck for a moment there, was that uh, it, there's been a, an increasing amount uh, in the, of, of uh, conversation in, uh, in the community about um, what we know about learning styles and what we know about its implications for the way in which people learn. And there does seem to be some increasingly quizzical um, comments being made about to what extent do we need to worry too much about learning styles as long as within more broad experiences we're not subjecting people only to certain sorts of experiences. And I think that in some respects um, we can go back to earlier sorts of uh, questioning about what is acceptable. And I can remember as a, as a young student um, sitting in a lecture and being told that the average uh, person has got an attention span of 40 minutes. Um, it, it was a, an interesting situation that the lecture on that occasion took an hour and a half to tell us that we had an audio, uh, an attention span of 40 minutes. But the point I'm making here is that um, we need perhaps to attend to what is um, possible by making sure that forgetting learning styles for a moment, but we need to think about providing variety for them because we um, have limited attention span rather than we have a preference for one thing rather than another. So in general, this is a question of a program design. Does a program as a whole allow people to do different things at different times during the course of the day? And B, within any one session, do you have sufficient variety to make sure that people feel, well, this is a bit different to something that I've been doing before? And I've got to say, the toughest thing about going to, a, for example, a conference is sitting for hours at a time listening to person after person after person speaking for 20 minutes or so without those opportunities to get together with um, people that you've been sitting with and having a natter about the implications of those sorts of things. So I think it is about responding to the need for variety rather than attending too much to, uh, to learning styles. Although I, I still have some thinking that, you know, Learning styles can be an important ingredient in terms of our planning for, for programmes as a whole. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mike. I hope that uh, answers your question, Darshan. But I think you have just added yourself to uh, to Mike's Twitter account, as I saw on the screen. And so, uh, so if you have any questions, I'm sure you can, uh, you can ask Mike directly on Twitter. Uh, next question is from Alan. And Alan said, uh, in your opinion, what's the best time for him to teach than to have a break to allow student time to retain the information? which leads on quite nicely to your, best, your last statement. What's the best time, was it? Yeah, what's the best time for him to teach than to have a break to allow the student time to return oh, the information? Uh, I mean, that, this follows on quite nicely from the previous um, my previous response. I think that um, you need to have, you know, things changing round about every 30, 40 minutes or so, quite frankly. Um, change in emphasis, change in structure, change in format, change in place. Um, Opportunities for coffee, because that's about meeting physiological needs. The opportunity to go to the loo if you need to. All of those sorts of things are important ingredients in, a, in, in planning a program as a whole. And within a session, I think if you've been given a session that is designed to last for an hour, within that time, you've got to think about breaking it up into um, activities that involve possibly sitting listening, but then engaging in problem solving, little problem solving activities, small buzz group activities, all of those sorts of things that can contribute towards uh, effective exploration of dialogue, even down to asking slightly more complicated um, questions, for example, and uh, getting them to discuss um, uh, dilemmas or whatever uh, uh, amongst themselves before coming leading up to a large group. You know, variety is, uh, I think, a key ingredient as much as time. 
but you know you need to build the uh, the time component into that variety and I think um, to expect people to do one thing for much more than um, maybe 30 minutes at a time um, it can be a, a bit of a challenge before you know you're inviting them to reflect on on what their experiences have been perfect okay next question is what <laughs> makes a training or learning experience successful ah Good question. That really is a good question. And I did allude to uh, this uh, earlier on. Um, the conventional model of evaluating a training intervention is um, is uh, something called the Kirkpatrick hierarchy. And perhaps we'll talk about this on, a, on another occasion at more length. But the, the bottom end of the Kirkpatrick hierarchy is about uh, learner satisfaction. Did people enjoy their experience? And in some respects, that's an extremely important question. But it is also a relatively low level question when it comes to providing the organization that sponsored the activity with some detailed feedback about what they need. The second level is um, have the participants learned anything. Um, the third level, and this is increasingly challenging in terms of getting access to data, is has their behavior changed uh, as a consequence of the learning that they've had. And right at the final level is has organizational learning um, changed as a consequence of the learning of individual participants in an organization. And there are more sophisticated and more challenging approaches to evaluation, but this is a useful um, uh, sort of uh, entry level uh, uh, appreciation of, of evaluation. And each level has got its own particular problems in getting a, um, a good answer um, to the question that you're posing. Um, Essentially, it's something that we've got to do, but we've got to acknowledge the fact that every bit of information that we get is is uh, is limited. And the higher you go up the hierarchy, the more complex it is to actually discover the answer to your question. Has this particular intervention made a difference? So, you know, it depends on your purpose, perhaps, in asking the question in the first place. At the most basic, did you enjoy this? Did you uh, think that you learned something from it? Is a an interesting and helpful measure of whether a, a session has been successful or not. But you then want to know, have people learned? Have they changed? Has their organization changed as a consequence? More of a challenge to find that out. Good answer. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Interesting. Uh, and the last question, Mike, is from Ryan. And Ryan said, for adult learners and the ever-increasing use of technology, uh, such as, for example, Prezi, which uh, Ryan confesses to use, would you encourage this approach for providing medical training whereby the majority of training can be provided by distance learning, incorporating our busy lives, and then only utilize traditional classroom and instructors for practical skills or testing, thus keeping training costs down? Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's difficult to answer briefly. I think what we've got to look for is ways in which we can maximize the use of a variety of resources to give people good learning experiences uh, um, and at the same time sort of you know be cost effective and accessible and available and all that sort of stuff and I think that that can be a, be a bit of a challenge. When um, uh, virtual learning first became at the beginnings of, of possibility uh, which I think I sort of tend to put down to the sort of mid 1990s when I first got involved in aspects of it. Uh, an awful lot of people were putting their PowerPoint presentations onto um, some sort of platform, like um, you know, I don't know, whiteboard, or, you know, a number of other ones that emerged at that particular time, and they were horrendous. Um, I think a great deal of effort has gone in at, in the interim to developing. Uh, approaches to virtual learning that are considerably more engaging and interactive and um, in some respects you know these have had some success but I think they've also uh, raised questions I think about almost by virtue of the fact that they're so widespread now that people have got a little bit sort of blase about the way in which um, uh, virtual learning developers have tried to create uh, virtual environments that are interactive, engaging and so on. For me, part of the problem of, of virtual learning is almost um, the isolation that the learner finds themselves in. You know, you're sitting here on your own, working your way through something that is, you know, apparently interactive, but you're interacting with the material rather than interacting within the more uh, important, for me, social environment of of the learning community. 
Uh, and I think that that is uh, among the challenges that we continue to have to address, but looking for ways in which perhaps we can extend this sort of, this sort of conversation a little bit further um, using the technology that's available to us. That's right. It's in interesting, Mark. Yeah, we, we did some research um, about two years ago within CPDME. <coughs> we looked at providing some um, some physical courses, some physical drop-in sessions where we'd talk about yeah. um, constructing a portfolio, where we'd talk about identifying learning needs. And um, people preferred the online learning option as opposed to physically meeting within a classroom setting. And, th and the feedback yeah. we got was people don't have to travel. They don't need to incur yeah. extra expenses. Um, they don't need to think about planning their life around that day and perhaps having to go shopping the night before with a wife because that full day is going to be around that learning yeah. experience, which may only be one or two hours. Um, whereas, interestingly, yeah. we've now adopted the webinar method. And, and as we discussed before the webinars this evening, um, it's increasingly popular because people can, can yeah. do everything they have to do all day and know that just for an hour in the evening, they can they can set that hour aside, they can take part in some good structured learning via <coughs> webinar, they can ask questions now live via, um, like we did with Richard earlier, by unlocking the microphone. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it doesn't cost anything, they're not traveling anything, they don't have to particularly plan their entire day around it. Um, and then if they take part in the event, we can drop the certificate directly after them without them having to, to worry about scanning it and, and uploading it. And so interesting yeah. how times have moved on and how we now uh, yeah. take advantage yeah. of this new Indeed. technology. Yeah. Perfect. I think that is it for questions, Mike. I think that is all I've got. But again, um, it, if you have any more questions, you can fire us an email and we'll forward them on to Mike. Or indeed, you can follow Mike on Twitter um, and, and ask questions via that. Um, but, but it's back. If I can just of course you can. move, if I can just move towards then from from um, questions to um, uh, the final bit of my comment. The first is a little bit of a plug. Two books that uh, will pursue these particular issues a little bit further. I mentioned them on my last talk. Uh, the one on the left hand side is the one that's associated with the, mainly with the life support uh, community for their instructor cohort and the one on the right is a slightly more extended version of the territory that's covered in there. And in summary as I move towards the final few words, um, essentially this is where I can be contacted and this is the territory that we've been covering. The essential ingredients of environment set is all of the bottom four of those things of the um, the cognitive uh, uh, sorry of Bloom's uh, of um, Maslow's hierarchy of need uh, and the dialogue if it's working very well is the point at which learners are beginning to self-actualize thank you very much indeed for your attention uh, I've uh, found that um, particularly the, the the last 20 minutes or so um, very engaging and uh, I've enjoyed that considerably thank you very much yeah good thank you very much indeed Mike um, it's always good to have you back and I think you have got a couple more sessions planned with us and so uh, no doubt we will see you back in the uh, the webinar arena uh, just before we go ladies yeah. and I will just point out some more webinars that we have planned for you over the next um, few weeks <laughs> in fact next week in fact we have uh, one presented by my colleague Andy Thomas on surgical airways on the 28th of March. Uh, what I will say is there is only about 10 spaces left on that webinar before it is a full house. And so it is worthwhile um, jumping over there and getting booked onto that. And then we have um, two interesting webinars presented by um, a gentleman who's doing some PhD research, uh, Brendan Gray, uh, one of them on fabricator induced illness, uh, what otherwise used to be known as Munchausen's um, syndrome by proxy. And that's on the 21st of April. Again, it's booking up really, really quickly. Uh, the second one, again presented by Brendan on the 27th, discusses the journal from referral to response. And I'm guessing looking at uh, some of the names I recognise on tonight's list, we have lots of people here who work in a pre-hospital setting or within a, an NHS setting. And what Brendan's going to discuss within this presentation is what happens when you make that social care referral. Uh, from the moment the, um, the social work team or the emergency use team pick up that response, what happens next? Uh, and what forms part of the decision making process to, uh, to how we deal with them children. Uh, a fabulous um, presentation on the 11th of May by Mr Paul Younger uh, with an introduction to paramedic points of care ultrasound uh, and for anybody working in um, pre-hospital medicine within paramedic practice uh, knows that ultrasound is quite a common um, topic being spoken about at the moment uh, so that will be on the 11th of May. Uh, we have got a new speaker, um, Amanda Mansfield, who's a consultant midwife from London Ambulance Service, uh, and she's going to go through some um, what, what she determines as a Marmite um, series of maternity. Uh, the feet are coming first, one of my true nightmares in practice, uh, and she's going to discuss there how you would manage that in um, 
in a pre-hospital setting. And so there's a few more webinars, um, and I'll point out where you can go to them. You simply just need to go to cpdme.com slash webinar, or just simply Google search um, cpdme free webinars, and indeed you will find them online. Uh, so all that leads me to say really is thank you very much for spending this Sunday evening with us. Uh, we've had a good hour of, of some good concrete learning there. Thank you very much to Dr. Mike Davis for joining us. Thank you, Mike. Thanks very much, Andrew, and good night, everybody. And thank you very much indeed for everybody taking part in this evening's webinar. As again, quickly jump over, have a look at what we've got coming for the next couple of months. Join on there. If you're not a member of CPDME, you can also go to cpdme.com and join us. And we'll, within the next 24 hours, drop your certificate and a copy of the recording directly into your portfolio for you, which makes it simple.